given anything has been for your sakes in the presence and with the approval of Christ the Messiah. And he says, I did it to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. For we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions. Being ignorant, being uninformed, lacking knowledge, causes unbelievable problems. And although we find the Apostle Paul that because he was ignorant and lacked knowledge, he received grace from God, that doesn't mean that we cannot even unknowingly open doors for the enemy that he can walk through and bring destruction into our lives. I was in church many, many, many years before I even had understanding that the devil was a real problem in life. I thought the devil was a Halloween character, somebody in a red suit with a pitchfork and a red tail. I mean, that's about all I knew about it. And I just had no idea the problems that he was causing me. I had no idea, for example, what kind of door I opened when I stayed mad at people, which I did frequently. I can tell you that there are unbelievably huge numbers of angry Christians. It's amazing the problem that this causes in people's lives. You may have 40, 50 opportunities every week to get offended, but you don't have to take those opportunities. Paul said, I'm not going to let Satan get an advantage over me. When you harbor unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, offense, you're not hurting the person who hurt you. You're hurting yourself, and you're opening a door for the devil. When God tells you to forgive, it's for your benefit. We have to remember that Satan is deceptive, and we have to keep those doors closed. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, just a couple of opening scriptures, get us a little foundation here. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times, at all times, at all times, not just on Sunday morning, not just once in a while, at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams about like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. He roams about like a roaring lion, but Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? Our God reigns. We have to be aware of Satan's wiles and his intentions. We have to know his nature. You know, we study the nature of God. I study the character of God a lot. One of the ways that you can learn to hear from God is by knowing Satan's character and by knowing God's character. So you know right away when you hear something or feel something or sense something, if the nature of what you're feeling and sensing is God or if it's not God. I don't think we can ever hope to successfully hear from God if we don't know the nature of not only God but our enemy. So there's four things that I want to discuss with you throughout this weekend that are all strategies of Satan, and they're things, major things about his character and his nature that we need to be well aware of. Number one, Satan is a liar and a deceiver. Number two, he is the destroyer. He wants to destroy everything in our lives that is good. He also is a controller and a manipulator. He wants to steal your freedom. He doesn't want you to be free in any area of your life. And he is the accuser of the brethren. Now I think if we can learn about these four things this weekend, we can go out with some information and revelation knowledge that's going to help us not to get deceived by the enemy. So Father, we thank you for this word, and we know that the devil does not like it when we talk about him, when we expose him, and we've already prayed and thank you ahead of time for a great victory, and that whatever little plan he has is not going to work. People are going to learn. They're going to pay attention. We're going to have peace in this place. And I thank you that the enemy is going to be exposed in people's lives and their eyes are going to be opened and things are going to be different for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, 
Whatever name you hear him called by, Lucifer the devil, Satan, the evil one, the deceiver, the seducer, the liar, the big thing you have to know is that he comes for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to kill, steal, and destroy. John 10, 10, you hear me quote this all the time. I love this. Actually, the name of our television program is kind of based off of this scripture because it kind of has been my experience. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came. I'm so glad about that, aren't you? I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. So Satan wants to take away everything he can, but God wants to add everything that he can. Satan wants to leave us with nothing. God wants to give us so much that it's overflowing out of our lives and splashing all over everybody else around us. Amen? Jesus did not just come so we could have life, but enjoy our lives. And I will tell you that the devil does not want you to enjoy anything. He doesn't want you to enjoy yourself. I spent many years being against myself, not liking myself, not liking my personality, not liking my voice, not liking this, not liking that. And I want to tell you that I enjoy myself now, and it makes the devil mad when you enjoy yourself. Amen? I like all my little idiosyncrasies, all my little strangeness and unique things about me. And it makes the devil mad when you have a good relationship with you. You know why it makes him mad? Because if you ever get a good relationship with yourself, you're going to start loving other people. But you cannot give away something that you don't have. If you don't like yourself, you can't like anybody else. We need to take time to ponder how wicked the devil is and that he is the source of evil everywhere. All the stuff going on in the world that's bad. My gosh, the news could just depress anybody. I mean, murders and rapes and theft and greed and, I mean, the whole message is you can't trust anybody and everybody's crooked and everybody is corrupt. and. Satan is the source of all of it. Now, that doesn't mean that the people that are doing these bad things don't have responsibility, but when they feel greedy, many of them, through lack of knowledge, they don't even know that that's the devil trying to steal from them. They think the more money they can get, the happier they're going to be, and little do they know that the more they get in wrong ways, the more miserable that they're going to be. You know, we might say, well, you know, with all this evil going on, if God is so good and God is so big and he's so much more powerful than the enemy, then why, why, why does it seem right now like the enemy's winning? Well, of course, we've already read the end of the book, so we know that that's not going to be the case. But I can tell you what I believe is going on. First of all, people are passive. By and large, people are passive. And if you actively choose God, and you choose God's ways, every person who does that is like a little, little light in the dark. And if there were millions of little lights out there, lots of good things happen. You see, even a lot of people who call themselves Christians, they're not really doing anything to help anybody else. To be honest, so much of our teaching in, in the charismatic Christian church even the Word and Faith Church over the last 30 years has been how I can get everything I want by using my faith. How I can get my breakthrough. How I can get, how I can get, how I can get. Even our ministries, how I can get my ministry to grow and I, I, and me, me, me. And God gave us faith, but He doesn't want us to use it just to get everything that we want. He wants to work in our lives and heal us and make us whole, but then he wants us to spend our lives helping other people yes. to bring to them the same thing that he brought to us. Yes. And so even Christians are not very effectively letting their light shine because here again, sometimes just 
lack of understanding that that's where life really is. You cannot be selfish and be happy. If you don't hear me say anything else tonight, hear that. You cannot be selfish and be happy. And if you're unhappy, maybe you need to stop blaming it on your spouse, your kids, your lack of income, your this, your that, your something else, your past, you know. And maybe you need to say, what am I doing to help somebody else? And you'd be surprised how joy starts to bubble up in you when you get your mind off yourself. Come on now, I'm preaching better than you're acting. So if we had enough lights out there and enough people aggressively living the Christian lifestyle, walking in love, we really wouldn't have all the junk that we've got going on today. But what's happened is we've just passively sat by and we wish God would do something and we wish the government would, we do, would do something. We wish and we wish and we don't understand why nobody's doing nothing. And, you know, we want they and them and they need to do something. And, you know, I finally figured out we are they. Who are they? We are they. And every one of us has a responsibility to do our part. The Bible says you can cast out a devil, and that devil will come back around, and if he finds the house that he occupied before swept and clean and empty, he'll move back in and bring seven more with him. Well, that's such a message for passivity versus activity. See, what happens is if we would all be aggressively believing God and having the lights turned on, then we wouldn't see the darkness that's in the world today. But when people do nothing, evil takes over. Do you understand me? Evil is getting an upper hand because believers are not active enough. It's not enough to go sit in a pew once a week on Sunday morning for 45 minutes. Going to church on Sunday doesn't fix every problem you've got, and it doesn't fix what's wrong in the world. We've got to get it out of the church, into the streets, into the marketplaces, into our schools, into the government, into our jobs. And I hope to have the privilege of giving the rest of my ministry and my life to teaching these very principles to people. That Jesus said, one new commandment I give unto you that you love one another just as I have loved you. And we've got to learn what that means. And it's not talk, it's not theory, but it's getting out there and being a light in a dark place. And let me tell you something, when the light is turned on, the darkness has to go. Now. Just to show you what I'm talking about, I want us to take time to look at a, a scripture, two actually, in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, and we will put them up on the screen. Haggai, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. I find these scriptures to be very enlightening, and they teach a great principle. A question was being asked about meat that had been offered in sacrifice to God versus meat that had been offered to idols. And so here, here it goes. If one carries in the skirt of his garment flesh that is holy because it's been offered in sacrifice to God, and with his skirt of the flaps of his garment he touches bread or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any kind of food, does what he touches become holy, dedicated to God's service exclusively? And the priest answered, no. Now, I want you to get this. Holiness is not infectious. See, they couldn't become holy just because they were carrying something holy. It had to be a personal choice. Now, I, I want you to get this. You can catch disease, but you can't catch health. Amen. Amen? Godliness has to be chosen, but ungodliness will just run rampant if people are not 
actively making right choices. See, this whole thing about the love walk and the fruit of the Spirit or patience or anything, you got to do it on purpose. It's not a feeling, it's a willing. And that's the problem, is Christians have become passive. Satan becomes a manipulator and a controller, and we want to feel like doing everything. That's going to be a major emphasis for me in this upcoming year, 2010. We have to stop relying so much on our feelings. It's a willing, we will to do what is right. We decide that we're going to put on love. We decide that we're going to get out in the darkness and turn our light on, no matter how we feel. Now, let's look at the second part of the scripture. Then Haggai said, if one who is ceremonially unclean because he has come in contact with a dead body should touch any of these articles of food, shall it then become ceremonially unclean? And the priest answered, it shall be unclean because unholiness is infectious. Now, so here's the way it works, just to put it simple. Evil can be caught if you just stand around it and do nothing. So you go out in the world where all the wickedness is and where the world is full of so many bad things and if you're not aggressively making right and good choices and letting your light shine, you know what? You'll begin to become like them. And the sad thing is, is it can happen so subtly and such a little tiny bit at a time that you don't even know. I think that we have had so much compromise in our Christian walk at this point that I don't think that people even know what's right and wrong anymore. Evil has become good and good has become evil. And there's more and more compromise and people make more and more excuses for doing the silly things that they want to do that God clearly condemns in His Word. And we need to have right messages coming from our pulpits. It's great to encourage people. It's great to tell them that God wants them to succeed and prosper and He wants to heal them and bless them. Yes, amen, I believe all of that. And we need to hear that to be encouraged. We don't need to be beat up every time we go to church. But we also have to be told that God is God and He is to be reverently feared and He means what He says. And we cannot know what's right and purposely choose to do what's wrong and expect to be protected. Amen? Amen? So we need to start making choices. And let me tell you something. Please hear me. Do not wait for somebody else to be the first one to make a right choice. Don't you dare say, well, why should I be the only one? Why shouldn't you be the only one? Why shouldn't you be the one that leads a revolution of righteousness? Why shouldn't you be the one to stand up and start doing what's right and making right choices. You might be surprised what a leader you are. People are looking for something good and right and wholesome to follow. They're waiting for us to stand up and take our place. I am tired of unbelievers making fun of Christians, but in some ways I don't blame them. Because I'll tell you, we've got to have more than a bumper sticker and a rhinestone cross, and a big Bible, and a tape recorder. Amen. And I'm not going to go out in the world and be passive and just catch every wicked disease that's out there. I'm going to go out aggressively, and I'm going to try to infect people with what I've got. I'm going to do it on purpose. Amen. So that means every day you got to get up and not live for yourself. Well, that don't sound like much fun. <laughs> well, are you having any fun doing what you're doing? You know? We have to be aware of Satan, but we don't want to focus on him excessively. However, we need to realize that passivity is one of the enemy's greatest strategies. He comes against our will, and we depend way too much on feelings. We're going to talk about that more in another lesson. John 8, says that Satan is a liar. The truth is not in him. He works continually to deceive people, to get them to believe lies. 
However, if we believe lies, they become truth to us even though they are not true in reality. Isn't that amazing? That you can believe a lie, it is not true at all, but yet if you believe it, it becomes your truth, it becomes your reality. Because the Bible says, be it unto you even as you believe. And as a man believes in his heart, so is he. So does he become. I loved God as much as I knew how to, but I wasn't being taught what I needed to be taught to, to really understand these things. For example, I, as I said, I went to church for years and I didn't even know the devil was a problem. I mean, I really didn't know he was a problem. I mean, I saw him in the pages of the Bible and I knew that, you know, he had a few arguments with Jesus, but I really didn't know that he was a problem in my life today. <laughs> and that's pretty sad when you can be in church for years and not even know that the devil is wrecking your life and that he's behind every opportunity that you have to be offended, every time that you want to harbor unforgiveness, every time that somebody makes fun of you and embarrasses you and rejects you and abandons you, that he's the one that's behind it. And so that was the beginning of a great change for me. Actually, I read a book, of, a book, I don't even know if it's out anymore, called Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. And that was like, wow. I began to realize that all of these problems that I was having was not just, well, whatever. Just the way life is. Just got to try to muddle through till you can get to heaven. Just keep going to church every Sunday and living in my Christian cul-de-sac, going round and round and round. And... <laughs> Come on. Hoping I can make it till Jesus comes back. How are you today, Joyce? Under attack. <laughs> Man, when I started learning the truth, whoo, I got mad about all the years I'd lost. Whoa! It's pathetic. For people to just go to church week after week after week and never hear anything but doctrine. We need good, strong doctrine. Do not misunderstand me. I, we need that. We need to know why we believe what we believe, and it needs to be right, and it needs to be biblical. But we have to teach people how to live. We have to teach people how to get out there and be what God wants them to be and how to really have the life that Jesus died for them to have. I think the greatest tragedy is for, for somebody to actually believe that Jesus died for them and receive him as their savior and never have any victory while they're here on this earth. I think that is tragic. I don't think Jesus died so we could just barely get by until he comes by, back to rescue us. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Come on, give God a shout. You know, a lot of times we just put up with stuff that we really don't have to put up with because we don't realize that God has given us power and authority. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses, and nothing shall in any way harm you. You know, when we get really serious about doing things God's way, then he responds to us with answers. When we get proactive against our enemy's schemes, the enemy backs off. Today we're offering a wonderful teaching resource. It's called What the Devil Doesn't Want You to Know. And you can either get four audio teachings or two DVDs. The Battle Belongs to the Lord is a paperback book that we want to send you also that teaches you how you can win every battle and enjoy yourself while you're doing it. If I were you, I wouldn't miss these resources because some of you are putting up with stuff that you don't have to put up with. God's called me to work in two square inches. It's the mouth, a tooth for a soul. So every tooth we take out, I pray that the Lord saves that soul. It changes their life. You know, if they don't know any better, they just can't expect any better. 
but if we can make them realize that there is a better, then a better does come about. It's a good way to reach into the hearts of people. Battlefield of the Mind has been my number one book for many, many years. Originally released in paperback, now it's been released in a commemorative hardback edition with updated stories and testimonies of people who have already read the book. You need to get a copy of this book. You can think things on purpose that are going to help you and add to your life, and you can begin to think the way God wants you to think. The Battlefield of the Mind commemorative edition available now. Because greater is He, not might be, could be, someday if I try hard enough. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. When you partner with Joyce Meyer Ministries, you have this sense of fulfillment that you're helping people every day. That's really amazing. You are here. You mean more to us at Joyce Meyer Ministries than you may ever know. We appreciate you, and we thank our friends and partners for making this worldwide ministry possible. Together, we're feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, and presenting the gospel to the nations. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org today to share your prayer requests, find out more about our resources, see Joyce's conference schedule, and to join us in partnership as we share the love of Christ around the globe. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Well, next on Enjoying Everyday Life, you can learn key strategies to protect yourself against an enemy who works nonstop to wear you down and wear you out. Satan is against anything that is for righteousness, peace, joy, love, generosity, compassion, kindness. He vehemently opposes our progress in any of these areas or when we make any type of spiritual advancement or progress. There is no telling how many people that the enemy talked out of coming to this meeting tonight that intended to be here. And let me tell you, please be wise enough to consider the subject this weekend. And make a decision now, devil, I'm going to every one of those meetings. If I got to walk, if I got to take a cab, if I got to crawl, I don't care if every friend backs out on me and won't go, I'm going. Because if you think that he'll roll the red carpet out for you, you are wrong. This morning, just trying to put my contact lens in my right eye. I had to take it out six times and do it again. I said, go ahead, wear yourself out, devil, because I'm expecting to be aggravated this weekend. I've been around the block a few times. It takes guts to preach this kind of stuff, amen? Now. As we fight our battles with the enemy, we have to remember that we are fighting not for victory, but from victory. Makes, makes the fight and the battle totally different if you realize that you're not trying to get some kind of victory, you've already got the victory and you're just letting the devil know that. My goodness, I felt so beat down and beat up and so broken and messed up. Little did I know that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. We're going to look at some of these scriptures because I want you to see them. 1 John 4, 4. We quote this scripture all the time, but it's very good to see it. Little children, you are of God. You belong to him. And you have already defeated and overcome them the agents of the Antichrist. Because he who lives in you is greater and mightier than he who is in the world. Woo. You have already, you, every one of you, 
If Jesus is your Savior and your Lord, you have already defeated and overcome the agents of the Antichrist because greater is he, not might be, could be someday if I try hard enough, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Well, if that's true, then why do I have all these problems? Now, don't misunderstand me. I know that our problems can be painful, but don't focus so much on your problems. Here's what you need to do. Your problem is not nearly as important as how you act while you're going through it. Did anybody in this building hear me? I said, your problem is not nearly as important as how you behave while you're going through it. Because the power that God has given us is to go through difficult things but remain godly in the midst of them. That's why I tell people, even when you're in trouble, you keep giving, you keep blessing, you keep doing something for somebody else. You know why? Love is spiritual warfare. That's the highest form of spiritual warfare that you can do. When you just feel like somebody has ripped your insides out and everything in you is bleeding and bruised, and you on purpose go do something for somebody else. I mean, it is just like tearing the devil up. Romans 8, 37, we all pretty much familiar with this. We are more than conquerors through Christ. Not we will be, we could be, we might be. We are more than conquerors. Somebody who is more than a conqueror is somebody who's married to a man who goes out and gets a paycheck, brings it home, and she spends it. That's what it means to be more than a conqueror. That's my joke for the evening. You better laugh. Colossians 1.13. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself. Not he might. Maybe someday he will. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Whew. I love it. And then Luke 10, 19. This is a wonderful scripture. Behold, that means look and see. Big exclamation marks. That means he must have been a little louder. Behold. <laughs> like a little wink from God. I have given you authority and power. Not I will, I might someday if you're good enough. I have given you authority and power to trample on serpents and scorpions. And I've given you physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. Come on. Don't be going around saying, oh, the world's going to pot, it's too late. I can tell you what, we can win the war that is going on if we will just, every person who calls themselves a believer in Jesus Christ will get out in your little section of the world and let your light shine. If we don't do that, there's no hope. This battle is not going to be won sitting in a pew on Sunday morning, getting fat on the Word and doing nothing with it. Amen? And what about all these unbelievers? Love them into the kingdom. I'm not talking about letting people walk all over you and being abusive, but... The way you win the lost is by serving them. People cannot argue with genuine, consistent love. Amen? It's really not that difficult. All you got to do is start thinking. <laughs> Listen to what people say. I was in a furniture store here in your town today. A little shop that has decorating items and some 
furniture and I had a Starbucks coffee with me. And the guy said, he kept saying, oh, that coffee is driving me crazy. He said, I want a cup of coffee so bad I can hardly stand it. So, you know, I'm practicing this love thing. I'm not going to get up and try to teach it to you and not practice it. So the thought came to me, what, just, I had some people with me. He said, go get him a cup of coffee. So I said, well, you like coffee, huh? He said, yeah, I love coffee. Oh, this smells so good. <laughs> and I said, well, what kind of coffee you drink? He said, oh, just black coffee. So I said, well, we'll have somebody go get you a coffee. And he's like, oh, you don't have to do that. I said, oh, no, I won't do. Well, then later, he asked one of the other people with us what we're doing here, and she told him, and he said, you know, I live right down the street from me. I think I'm going to come over there tonight. Amen. Now, I don't know if he's here tonight or not, but you know what? You'd be surprised how open people would be to you if you start acting like what you say that you are. Amen? Amen? I didn't give him a religious look and a gospel track. I got him a cup of coffee. Amen? Amen? Now, I admit, I have to grow a little bit with the coffee thing. I was in Canada. I was going down the street, and there was a man there that was crippled, and he was begging. And so we gave him some money, and, and uh, I had a cup of coffee, and I had a, some kind of sweet thing from... Starbucks, and usually when I get them, I take about two bites and I'm done with them. What did I have? I had a cookie, didn't I? Wasn't it a cookie I had? Yeah. And uh, so the guy says to me, um, could, you get, could you get me a cup of coffee over there across the street? And we actually were really almost late where we we're going. And I said, you know what? We, I said, I'd love to, but we've got to get where we're going. But I said, here, how would you like to have this cookie? So I gave him my cookie, and he was all thrilled, and I took about five or six more steps, and then the Lord caused me to realize, why didn't I give him my coffee? <laughs> well, because my coffee... <laughs> I mean, it's like... <laughs> I mean, to be honest, it's sad, but I didn't even think to give the man my coffee because... <laughs> I wanted the coffee. I was done with the cookie, but I wanted the coffee. Come on, now you see how we are. So I had two choices. I could give him my coffee, which was this cappuccino with the right amount of milk, or I could take a chance on being late for my boat and get him a coffee. I took a chance on being late and we got him coffee. I mean, you know, we're all that way. We've all got, you know, we don't mind giving till it hurts. Well, pressing on, I can see you don't need that. <laughs> Our protection from Satan is this right here. It's the Word of God. It's knowing it, loving it, obeying it, and using it against him when he comes at you. The best example that we have in the Bible is in Luke chapter 4. If you will not learn to speak the word of God out loud, thereby doing warfare with Satan, you will never be a winner in life. Luke chapter 4, Jesus had been led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. It was something that had to be established in his life before his public ministry began. It's great to talk about victory, but you will be tested. Everybody has to fight their own Goliath and win that battle. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. God didn't tempt him, but a point had to be proven to the enemy and Jesus needed the experience of defeating him. We need to see that. So Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse uh, 
Three, I think. Then the devil said to him, <laughs> the devil talks. <laughs> Not out loud like I'm talking to you, but he puts thoughts in your mind and sometimes he talks to you through other people. When Peter said to Jesus, oh, you must not go to Jerusalem and go through all this suffering and go to the cross, Jesus turned and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Sometimes the enemy will talk to you through other people. Sometimes even people that love you and care about you and they don't even realize that they're unwittingly being used by the enemy to discourage you, to hurt you to bring you down. That's why, brothers and sisters, we have to be encouragers. We have to be edifiers. Whether it's natural for you or not, you have to learn how to say every good thing to everybody that you can as often as you can. Because there's plenty of voices out there tearing people down, putting people down, and we need to be encouragers and edifiers. We need to lift people up. The Holy Spirit is an encourager, a comforter, an edifier. He comes alongside and strengthens us that we might get to the next level. We need to be encouragers. If you are the Son of God, then turn this stone into a loaf of bread. Notice that Satan attacked his identity. It, well, if you are the Son of God then turn this stone into a loaf of bread because Jesus was hungry. He'd already been not eating for 40 days. Right away, Jesus said, it is written. How powerful. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then Satan showed him all these things in the world. Took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the habitable world in a moment of time, in the twinkling of an eye. And Satan said to him, to you I will give all this power and authority and all their glory and their magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, and grace. You think that Satan won't offer you toys and trinkets? He'll offer you a higher position at work if you'll just compromise your integrity a little bit. He'll offer that young girl a motion picture deal if she'll just take her clothes off and pose for a magazine. Come on now. I'll give you all this if you'll just one time bow down to me. I hate the just once lie. Just once. Just this one time. How many times does the enemy get people? Just this one time. Not anymore, but just this one time. Jesus said, it is written. <laughs> you shall worship the Lord God, and him only shall you serve. I won't but that bow down to you. Not once, not twice, not a half a time. I'll only bow down to God. And then a third time he said to him, well now if you are the son of God, then why don't you just cast yourself down from here? Because God has said, now the devil starts quoting scripture back to him. You think that Satan can't take the scripture out of context and use it in your life? You better believe he can. That's why you got to be a little bit careful about this stuff. I need to hear from you, God. You know, that works a little while for baby Christians, but we got to grow beyond that. I mean, in the beginning of my walk with God, I mean, I could get some of the most amazing things doing that. Wow! And I'd go to David, I asked God this, and look what he gave me. And David would go, really? And it's hard to impress him. I'd be like, wow. But that only lasted a couple of months. God was establishing a relationship with me, and then it would be like, okay, God, I need to hear from you. Woe be unto you, you wicked sinner. And I'd go, whew, let's try again. You know how we are. We keep flipping until we get one we like. 
Come on. You know them promise boxes, if you don't pull out the one you want, you pull out another one. <laughs> you have to know this well enough that when Satan tries to misquote it, in an improper situation, you can even catch him at that. But Satan said to Jesus, well, if you are the Son of God, come on, do something. Prove yourself. You know what? You're not free until you know that you don't have to try to impress anybody or prove anything to anybody. There's such freedom that comes when you're not trying to impress people. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, it is written, you shall not test and try God. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to come up with some miracle jump here to impress you, even though I could do it, because God says, don't test him, don't tempt him, don't try him. Now, looking a little bit further in Luke chapter 4, I find a very interesting thing. Verse 13, I want you to see this because this is important. And when the devil had ended every, the complete cycle of temptation, he temporarily left him, that is, stood off from him until another more opportune and favorable time. Uh-oh, you know what that means? He ain't ever gonna leave you alone. Not permanently and totally, he'll go away for a while. Tempt have you ever noticed the temptation, trials and troubles, sometimes comes in cycles? It's like, man, how many things can go wrong at one time? Well, enough for the devil to try to wear you out. The Bible says that Satan seeks to wear out the saints. And I'm sure some of you came in here tonight thinking, I have had it, God. I am just completely, totally worn out. And now you're going to go out tonight saying, that's it, I know who I am. I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I've already won the war. I'm more than a conqueror. God is on my side. See, what the devil wants you to do is wake up in the morning and just be passing. Well, you know, I wanted to go over to that Joyce Meyer meeting. I wish I felt like it. <laughs> I wish my friend wouldn't have canceled out on me because I don't want to go by myself. <laughs> I wish I had some victory. <laughs> and the devil's going... You lazy, passive, lukewarm. We don't need wishbone, we need backbone. We need to get up and know who we are in Christ, amen? John 17, 11 and 12 says, we are kept safe in the knowledge of God. I love that. Our safety. I tell you what, I thank God for what I know. And I know I've still got a lot to learn, but let me tell you something, I know a lot too. I've been studying this for 32 years diligently. I've worn out dozens of these. I thank God for what I know. Because the more you know, not just head knowledge, not just some kind of psychological nonsense that you proud of what you know, but none of it's working in your life. But let me tell you something, when you really know this and you're putting it to work in your life, you are dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. And when you get up in the morning, hell shakes. Instead of you being nervous, the devil can get nervous. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, and we have to learn how to use the Word of God. Speak the Word of God out loud. I've got a little book that we have on our resource table called, we call it the Purple Book. It's called The Secret Power of Speaking God's Word Out Loud. You need to understand that angels hearken to the Word of God. They don't hearken to complaining and murmuring and grumbling and fault finding 
and gossip and bitterness and judgment and criticism. But when you begin to say, it is written, and you speak the Word of God, angels go to work in your behalf. <laughs> Satan is a deceiver. The mind is the battlefield. Satan comes against your mind. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down reasons and theories and imaginations. It's all talking about realms of the mind. Yeah. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the entire renewal of your mind. You know, a lot of times we just put up with stuff that we really don't have to put up with because we don't realize that God has given us power and authority. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses, and nothing shall in any way harm you. You know, when we get really serious about doing things God's way, then he responds to us with answers when we get proactive against our enemy's schemes, the enemy backs off. Today we're offering a wonderful teaching resource. It's called What the Devil Doesn't Want You to Know. And you can either get four audio teachings or two DVDs. The Battle Belongs to the Lord is a paperback book that we want to send you also that teaches you how you can win every battle and enjoy yourself while you're doing it. If I were you, I wouldn't miss these resources because some of you are putting up with stuff that you don't have to put up with. We love life! We love life! You can love your life. Let God renew and restore you at the 2011 Love Life Women's Conference. Jesus died for a purpose so I can have this quality of life. I'm going to do everything that I can to take hold of that life that Jesus died for me to have. There's nothing like being here live. It's exciting. It's thrilling. My mom right here, she said, we cannot just sit here and see on television. We should go. Be refreshed as you worship with Israel Houghton and celebrate with special music by C.C. Winans with dynamic messages from John and Stacy Eldridge, Nancy Alcorn of Mercy Ministries, and Joyce Meyer. Let him restore you at the 2011 Love Life Women's Conference, September 15th through the 17th in St. Louis. Register now. If you're gonna use wisdom, you can't be involved in everything out there just because you'd like to be. You gotta stop being nosy. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to be involved in everything. You gotta get a little bit of humility. There are some people out there that can do some things and do them right besides you. In 2006, we met a young Indian boy named Maipal, who had been terribly burned when a rat knocked over a kerosene lamp as he slept, instantly igniting his blankets and 